Defense Appropriations uh, Subcommittee. We're going to start a minute or two early, or early which is uh, unprecedented in the Senate, uh, because we have votes scheduled, and I want to try to get as much testimony in as possible before we might have to break for a vote, uh, should that occurrence arise soon. So I'll make my opening statement. I want to acknowledge at the beginning that uh, Senator Cochran is not late. No one is late at this point. I'm starting a minute or two in advance. Today, the Defense Subcommittee will receive testimony on national security space launches with a focus on the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle, or the EELV program. Our questions expose some of the core trade-offs in defense policy and highlights several challenges we face as a nation. What is the best use of taxpayers' money? How do we promote and reward innovation? How do we safeguard the viability of our industrial base? How do we protect our competitive edge against other nations? We'll return to these questions and many others throughout the year as we review the President's fiscal year 2015 defense budget, which we received just this week. Today, we discuss the EELV program, which was created almost 20 years ago when the cost and risks of launching satellites were out of control. EELV mission launches, uh, pardon me, missions launched the most important satellites developed by the Air Force, National Reconnaissance Office, and the Navy, not to mention NASA, and a few, uh, fewer number of commercial customers. The program has been extremely successful in launching satellites that cost the U.S. taxpayers literally billions of dollars. The safety record of the Atlas V and Delta IV rockets made by the United Launch Alliance is remarkable. But we do have some concerns about the acquisition strategy and cost and future of that program. From 2011 to 2014, the amount the Air Force budgeted for an average of six satellite launches per year grew by 60 percent in that three-year period. There are many answers as to why the program became more expensive, but the important question is, what should we do about it? Over the past three years, the Air Force has tried to control cost by stabilizing ULA production with a block buy of 36 rockets from ULA while fostering competition from new entrants such as SpaceX. The subcommittee needs to better understand the cost of the current program, how to ensure that competition is fair and presents the best, best value to the government, and whether we need to do more to ensure that we can deliver satellites on orbit in the most efficient and affordable manner. These decisions on how to purchase access to space could have lessons that are applicable to many other defense capabilities. Could the Pentagon learn to live with only one major supplier of rockets by better managing that industrial capability with smarter buying and better negotiating? Or should the Department of Defense be, move, be more forward-leaning and embrace companies that challenge the rules on how we normally run defense programs? It's been the general practice of the Appropriations Committee to direct questions about acquisition programs to the government officials responsible for the use of taxpayer money. Today, we're taking a different approach by going into the details of the EELV program with the two companies most involved in the upcoming competition, as well as two distinguished experts in space acquisitions. Their views and insights on the EELV program will inform the subcommittee's deliberations on the fiscal year 2015 budget request and also shape our thinking about how the Department of Defense can best maintain access to space in a fiscally constrained environment. I'm going to welcome our witnesses, Christina Chaplin, Director of Acquisition Sourcing and Management at the Government Accountability Office, Michael Gass, President and CEO of United Launch Alliance, Elon Musk, CEO and Chief Designer of Space Exploration Technologies, Dr. Scott Pace, Director of the Space Policy Institute at the Elliott School of International Affairs, George Washington University. I'm going to ask the uh, witnesses to provide their five-minute opening statements, uh, but I note the presence of the ranking member of the Full Appropriations Committee, Senator Shelby of Alabama, and I'd like to give you an opportunity, if you wish, for an opening statement. Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I will try to be brief because we have a distinguished panel here. Uh, Delivering national security satellites safely uh, to orbit is one of our most important national security missions. This requirement is precisely why the Department of Defense focuses on mission success and reliability in the evolved expendable launch vehicle, or what we call EELV program. This focus and the work of the EELV sole source contractor, the United Launch Alliance, has resulted in 68 consecutive successful missions. 
68 success, consecutive successful missions. I recognize this achievement, not just as a senator from Alabama, where the ULA, pro, uh, ULA performs its engine assembly work, but as someone who has watched the defense, defense industry for decades and knows that a 100% success rate is no small feat. As the Department of Defense moves forward with a new acquisition strategy for the EELV program, I believe we must ensure that the program's record of success is maintained. Much of today's discussion will focus on competition, and I agree that competition typically results in better quality and lower price contracts. But the launch market is not typical. It is limited demand and is framed by government industrial policies. And while the goal of competition is to lower the cost of access to space, which I think is good, combined with the need to maintain performance and reliability, such as we have today, competition may not actually result in a price reduction for the federal government. I believe that much of the cost, of, cost associated with the EELV program today can be attributed to the Department of Defense decisions about the structure of the program, including the practice of purchasing one launch vehicle at a time rather than a lack of competition. Simply modifying this buying strategy alone and moving into a new block buy approach has already resulted in significant savings and will ultimately say, uh, be saving billions of dollars. The Air Force, for example, has estimated $4.4 billion savings so far. The wise stewardship of taxpayer resources is essential to, in all government programs, and oftentimes competition is key. In this case, the safety and security of our national security payloads is paramount. I'm not convinced yet that a wholesale change in the EELV program is the answer when we have witnessed significant results from a minor modification to purchase and practice, practices in the existing program. But I do look forward to the testimony of our witnesses on the role of competition in this unique market and in exchange as to why a sea change in the program is necessary to achieve savings if it is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Shelby. And um, now we'll have our witnesses uh, give an opening statement. Their written statement will be made part of the record. If they'll take five or six minutes to summarize it, we can then open it to questions. And the first person to testify, Christina Chaplin, as I mentioned, Director of Acquisition Sourcing and Management at the Government Accountability Office, which has done a comprehensive review of this issue, which I commend to my colleagues and those who are following this debate. Ms. Chaplin, please proceed. Mr. Chairman, thank you for inviting me today. I'm very pleased to be here to discuss the EELV program. The program itself has been through different contract arrangements and acquisition strategies. There was competition at the beginning of the program with the aim of ultimately selecting one company, though the government opted to keep two companies based on the assumption that there would be a surge in commercial demand that would allow the government to benefit from lower costs. Fixed price contracts were used also in the early, early part of the program, and the government was able to benefit from prices that were lower because the companies purchased items in bulk, key items in bulk, in anticipation of the predicted high demand of the commercial market. After the commercial market did not materialize as expected, however, there were several significant changes. Two suppliers merged into one. The government began using a fixed price contract to acquire launch services and a cost type contract to acquire the capability to launch that hardware. In view of launch failures that occurred in the late 1990s with the Heritage Launch Program, the government placed most of its focus on mission success and not as much on controlling costs. And as you mentioned, there has been a good record of success since then. In 2011, the Air Force embarked on the block buy strategy in anticipation of significant price increases. However, the GAO found that the government did not have the knowledge it needed to make such a significant commitment, particularly with respect to program costs and the launch industrial base. At the time, there were also mixed views within DOD about the value and viability to introduce competition to help lower prices, but DOD ultimately set out to do so. Since our 2011 report, DOD has made strides in gaining knowledge about costs and other issues surrounding the ELV, and it has achieved significant savings in negotiating the block buy. There may be a debate as to the validity and extent of the savings, 
but we do know that the DOD performed the analyses and the studies that better armed it for negotiations. Further, the program now benefits from auditable business systems and greater oversight. DOD deserves much credit for these efforts. There were also significant positive changes in the new contracts, but the basic way of acquiring launch services remained the same. There's a fixed price arrangement for the vehicles themselves and a cost arrangement for the capability to launch the vehicles, which includes things like systems engineering and integration. It is important to keep in mind that the capability contract maximizes the government's flexibility, which is beneficial when there are delays in satellite deliveries. The block by contract is for 35 rocket cores, and DOD plans to compete up to 14 cores starting as early as 2015. There are a number of ways DOD could run this competition. We looked at two ways at each end of the spectrum for some recent work we did for the Congress. One is to contract similar to the way it currently contracts with ULA. The other is to follow a commercial approach. My statement details the benefits and challenges of both. In short, if DOD contracts similar to the way it contracts with ULA, DOD could retain insight into contractor costs and pricing data, which would lend itself to a better bargaining position in future negotiations. But this approach could also add costs. For the new entrants, including a cost plus portion in bid proposals, for instance, would require them to develop and install new business systems to fulfill government data requirements. If DOD followed a commercial approach, it could have an avenue to decrease launch prices and increase efficiencies. However, it would also likely lose access to contractor cost and pricing data and some flexibility in re rescheduling launches if satellites delivery skip. We did not recommend an approach. It is not GEO's role to do so, and there are other possible approaches. The goal of introducing competition is being achieved, though the competitors may prefer different paths. The factors that DOD will need to weigh as it makes its choice likely include the need to maintain a high degree of reliability as the satellites being launched are expensive and are vital to national security, the need for flexibility in launches, the importance of retaining cost and pricing data, the need to keep costs down, and considerations about the future government's demand for launch services. This concludes my statement, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Chaplin. We will have some questions. But next, we're going to hear from Michael Gass, President and CEO of United Launch Alliance. Mr. Gass. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Cochran, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to talk about the EELV program and the future of space launch. On behalf of the men and women of United Launch Alliance and the entire EELV supply team, we are honored to be entrusted with the responsibility of safely delivering critical national security capabilities to orbit. ULA also supports customers outside of national security. For NASA, we have launched science missions to the Moon, Mercury, Jupiter, and Pluto, and even sent the rovers on to Mars. Our customers extend beyond the government to commercial sector, with nine co commercial missions to date and several more on the manifest. I am also pleased to report that ULA and the government team have consistently delivered 100% mission success over 68 times since the inception of the program, delivering over $60 billion of taxpayer-funded satellites. We are currently at a tempo of a launch of one launch every month. ULA's Atlas V and Delta IV are the most powerful and most reliable rockets in the world. They are the only rockets that fully meet the unique needs of the national security community. The Air Force EELV program was openly and fairly competed in the late 1990s with a unique acquisition strategy at the time that required significant upfront investment by industry. Lockheed Martin's Atlas and Boeing's Delta products were the winners of that competition. Over the past 17 years, the program has continued to deliver, meeting the needs of our nation effectively and efficiently. The EELV program is entering a new era. The Air Force new acquisition strategy aims to maintain reliability and stabilize the industrial base while reducing costs and potentially reintroducing competition. The new strategy is a welcome improvement from the highly inefficient and costly approach of buying rockets one at a time. The next phase of the Air Force strategy is to reintroduce competition. I believe there are important questions about how EELV competitions will be structured to ensure they are fair and open and whether competition will actually save the savings that is promised. 
Ultimately, the central question is whether savings from competition will be sufficient to offset the cost of duplicating existing capabilities. ULA was formed to enable a short access to space with two separate launch systems with the recognition the market demand was insufficient to sustain two companies. We went from two competing teams and redundant and underutilized infrastructure to one team that has exceeded the savings of consolidation expectations. Looking to the future, ULA is investing in new technology and concepts to make our products better and more affordable. We are investing in internal funds to develop a capability to launch two GPS satellites at once, cutting launch costs almost in half. ULA, along with our government customers, is reviewing every requirement and every process to eliminate any unnecessary or inefficient elements. ULA also is aggressively expanding its customer base, both at NASA and the commercial sector, with additional launches because improved utilization of the fixed infrastructure improves the cost for all customers. ULA and our industry partners are working closely with NASA's Space Launch System and other DOD programs to find opportunities to improve product designs and efficiently utilize an existing industrial base infrastructure to lower the cost for all programs. On a personal note, I've been in this business for 35 years. I've worked with the government in every imaginable approach to buying launch services, from the traditional DOD contracting approaches to the commercial approaches from buying rockets and blocks to buying them individually. I've also worked extensively in the international and commercial sectors. I was there in the 1990s when the commercial demand for launch was projected to be dozens of launches per year, only to have the pro projected commercial demand evaporate overnight. I believe leveraging the demand of the commercial sector is smart, but relying on commercial demand to enable national security carries huge risks both to the rocket supplier and to its government customers. I've also experienced some of the launch industry's darkest days, such as in the late 1990s, prior to the EELV program, when the U.S. suffered a series of six major launch failures over a 10-month period. Those losses totaled billions of dollars and were a harsh reminder that launch is risky and extremely unforgiving. It's difficult to overemphasize the loss of national security those failures caused. I believe the impressive successes we achieved on EELV stem from the difficult lessons learned from those failures. These lessons include sustaining a laser focus on technical rigor and the importance of open and transparent relationship with our government customers and the acquisition strategies that align with customers' priorities. In summary, I believe the EELV program has been a major success for the nation. We will continue to provide the assured access the nation needs to deliver critical capabilities to orbit reliably and on schedule. We look forward to working with our government customers to further drive down costs without compromising the reliability and readiness. Thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Mr. Gass. Elon Musk, CEO and Chief Designer of Space Exploration Technologies. The floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I want to turn on your, there we go. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Conklin, members of the committee, thank you for having me here today. Uh, SpaceX was, was founded to make radical improvements to space transport technology, uh, with particular regard to reliability, safety, and, and affordability. Uh, today it is arguably one of the leading aerospace companies in the world with nearly 50 missions contracted at a, t at a value of approximately $5 billion. We have launched our Falcon 9 rocket eight times with a 100% success rate, including four launches for NASA, uh, three which docked with the International Space Station, uh, and, and, and have launched a sophisticated geostationary satellite for the world's leading satellite companies. Um, we, we are restoring America's competitiveness in the global commercial space launch market as the, the only U.S. company that is consistently winning head-to-head -head competitions for launch opportunities at the world level. With respect to the ELV program, uh, I have five points to make. The first is that the, the Air Force and other agencies are simply paying too high a price for launch. The impacts of relying on a monopoly provider since 2006 were predictable, and they have borne out. Space launch innovation has stagnated, competition has been stifled, and prices have risen to levels that General Shelton has called unsustainable. When, when the merger between Boeing and Lockheed's business occurred, the, the merger promised in the press release $150 million of savings. Instead, 
there were billions of dollars of cost overruns uh, and, and a non mccurdy breach for the program exceeding 50% of its cost projections. Uh, according to congressional records, in FY13, the Air Force paid an average of uh, $380 million for each national security launch while subsidizing ULA's fixed costs to the tune of more than a billion dollars a year, even if they never launch a rocket. By contrast, SpaceX's price is well under $100 million, meaning a savings of almost $300 million per launch, which in many cases would pay for the, the, the launch and the satellite combined. So if you took something like uh, a GPS satellite, which is about $140 million, you could actually have a free satellite with the launch. So our launch plus the satellite would cost less than just their launch, which, which is an enormous difference. And we seek no subsidies to maintain our business. Uh, to put this into perspective, had SpaceX been awarded the missions ULA received under its recent uh, non-competed 36 core block buy, we would have saved the taxpayers $11.6 billion. Competition, it, point number two, competition is coming to the national security market. This has been acknowledged, uh, and, and, and we, are ready to compete, we are ready to compete for that. In order to be certified as an ELV provider, SpaceX has had to meet a number of requirements that were never demanded of the incumbent provider. We were required to successfully launch three flights of our upgraded Falcon 9 vehicle, which we uh, achieved in, in January. Under our EL, ELV certification agreement, we are undertaking uh, vigorous engineering reviews with the Air Force. To date, we've delivered more than 30,000 data items to the Air Force and provided total access to our internal systems to more than 300 government officials for certification. And we hope to complete the, that certification this year. Um, and point number three is we really believe that robust competition must begin this, this calendar year. We applaud the early steps the Air Force and NRO have taken to reintroduce competition into the ELV program. In 2012, the Air Force under direction from the Secretary of Defense, committed to competing up to 14 missions, with five, available, with five missions available for competition this year. Of course, we would have greatly have preferred that the Air Force open all of its missions for competition. And, uh, and we have serious concerns that the five missions that will be competed this year will, will not actually be, that, 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 that these five missions will not actually be awarded this year. We've recently learned that perhaps only one will be awarded this year. Uh, point four, with the advent of competition, a launch should really be viewed as a commodity, and any competition between new entrants and ULA should properly acknowledge the launch subsidy received by the incumbent, consistent with federal procurement regulations and DOD acquisition directives. When a com competitive environment exists, the government should use firm fixed price FAR Part 12 contracts that properly, in properly incent contractors to deliver on time and on budget. That means eliminating the billion dollar subsidy, annual subsidy to, to ULA, which creates an extremely unequal playing field. And, and the final point is that our, our Falcon 9 Falcon Heavy launch vehicles are truly made in America. We design and manufacture the rockets in California and Texas with key suppliers throughout the country and launch them from either Vandenberg Air Force Base or Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. This stands in stark, stark contrast to the United Launch Alliance's most frequently flown vehicle, the Atlas V which uses a Russian main engine and where approximately half the airframe is manufactured overseas. In, in light of Russia's de facto annexation of Ukraine's Crimea region and the formal severing of military ties, the Atlas V cannot possibly be described as providing assured access to space for our nation when supply of the main engine depends on President Putin's permission. Given this development, it would seem prudent to reconsider whether the, the 36 core uncompeted sole source award to ULA is truly in the best interest of the people of the United States. I thank the committee for this opportunity and look forward to addressing any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, our last witness, Dr. Scott Pace, Director of Space Policy Institute, Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. Dr. Pace. Okay, thank you, Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Cochran, members of the committee. Uh, for providing this important opportunity to discuss the topic of national security space launches. Uh, as called for in U.S. national policy, the United States and the DOD in particular uh, need to decide how it best assures the existence of, quote, two U.S. space transportation vehicle families capable of reliably launching national security payloads, unquote. A space industrial base uh, meeting all government needs uh, cannot presently be sustained by private market demand alone. 
Thus, a significant degree of government support will be necessary for the foreseeable future. The EELV program as exists today is the result of technical, economic, and policy decisions made over several decades. Today, fiscal constraints, rising launch costs, limited demand, and strict government requirements have combined to create a complex ongoing debate about the role of competition in the procurement of EELV class launch services. The National Space Policy states, quote, that U.S. commercial space transportation capabilities that demonstrate the ability to launch payloads reliably will be allowed to compete for U.S. government missions on a level playing field consistent with established interagency new entrant certification criteria. I emphasize the phrase level playing field as the determination of just what this means is central to the question of competition going forward. Industry competition is a tool, not an end in itself. Depending on market conditions, competition can result in meeting DOD needs at lower cost or failing to meet those needs and merely shifting government costs to other accounts. The ELV program, as managed by ULA today, represents a high degree of experience and capability. As a potential competitor for national security launches, SpaceX brings, in my view, an intense focus on cost control while meeting customer launch needs. The policy issue is not one of SpaceX and other potential new entrants versus ULA as much as it is one of deciding what the role of DOD should be. What are the government's policy priorities? Should we be trying to, for example, get the lowest price for reliable transportation to orbit for a particular mission? Get the lowest price for all national security missions? Get the lowest price for all government-funded missions? Assure access to space for all needs with a U.S. industrial base at least cost. So the question is really is one of scope uh, that this committee wants to take. The Launch Services New Entrant Certification Guide is a thoughtful and prudent approach to assessing potential entrants. The more difficult question comes with what happens after a new entrant is certified. Will incumbents and new entrants with very different histories compete under the same rules? And whether they do or do not, what may be said about the rules themselves? Reliability and readiness have been the top priority for national security launches. Can the critical need for mission assurance be achieved at lower cost than the way we do it today? This certainly seems desirable, even plausible, but careful thought needs to be given as to what responsibilities and capabilities ought to remain within the government. Will the government have the authority to order a stand down of a vehicle family in the event of failure? Are agencies willing to relax or modify their use of cost accounting rules and other FAR-based requirements for all launch service providers? In short, how much is the government willing to pay for process and how much is it willing to pay for performance? Uh, I would note here the GAO's report I thought was very germane on this point in terms of pointing out some of the issues. Defense acquisition reform is a much larger topic than the present hearing, but it's nonetheless relevant. Deciding how to best acquire space launch services may provide opportunities for pilot testing some forms of regulatory relief. For example, the government could pay separately for non-commercial processes and deliverables rather than having all costs bundled into the launch cost or company overhead. The government may still pay more for its launches than a commercial buyer would, but the cost drivers would be more visible and accountable and would more easily allow cost-benefit trades for government decision-making. The most important consideration for any policy choice and implementing approach is that it be clearly stated and adequately funded with clear priorities as to which requirements, schedules, and goals will be relaxed if resources or regulatory relief is not forthcoming. To do otherwise is to invite failure. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Dr. Pace, thank you very much. And um, I think you can tell from the opening statements that uh, this is a subject that I found challenging to the committee and to Congress that uh, really called for a much different approach in hearing to bring together two companies from the private sector to express their points of view. I'm, I've done something that's a little unorthodox here. I've invited each of the companies represented, ULA through Mr. Gass and SpaceX through Mr. Musk, to submit 10 questions to the other side uh, so that we can hear what they consider to be the strengths and weaknesses of their position. And they, those will be submitted for the record, uh, and I encourage uh, each of them to respond uh, appropriately and in a timely fashion. Let's get, get down to some specifics if we can. Mr. Gass, Russia's in the news. 
and the question about sanctions by the United States against Russia for uh, their adventurism in Crimea uh, raise a question about our future relationship with this company or with this country. Mm -hmm. I ask you when it comes to your use of the RD-180 engine on your Atlas V missions, what you think is the reliability of that uh, engine being available from Russia uh, for the immediate future and whether the United States in the interest of its own defense should take that into consideration when it awards these contracts. Thank you, Senator Durbin, and uh, we all are watching uh, and caring for the people in the Ukraine in this situation. First, uh, let me kind of give a little bit of history on the engine. Uh, uh, we went to the former Soviet Union with, with encouragement from two presidential administrations more than two decades ago to look at capabilities that were in Russia, that were in, in the former Soviet Union. And what we found was a, an engine that was more advanced in technology and could be bought in a, in a cost competitive way that we had here in our country. What we have done in, uh, to protect and for that concern since the day we started with that relationship uh, more than two decades ago, we've protected the nation. And what do we do from United Launch Lines? First and foremost, we have two years of safety stock inventory. Actually, today we have greater than that in country and our ability to launch any of the near-term satellites that uh, we need to do for national security. At United Launch Alliance, we have another product that is fully compliant and ready to support any of the missions. So from a nation, we are not at, at any risk for supporting uh, our, our national needs. We've always kept our ability to not to be leveraged in the case of any kind of supply interruption. So I understand, uh, for clarity here, uh, you're saying that you have warehoused or stockpiled engines for two years, possible launches. Uh, what about the capacity to produce that same engine in the United States? Uh, thank you, Senator Dermott. We have, uh, as part of the deal that we uh, signed with the a company called RD Amros, was the joint venture of United Technologies and the company in Russia called NPO Energomash, we had a, a business deal where we could buy, co-produce that engine. We bought all the blueprints and specifications, brought them into the country, and demonstrate that we can take the blueprints and specifications that it were written in Russian, translated them, and at full arms length relationship, demonstrate we can build the most difficult products. And we've done that over ser several years. We invested hundreds of millions of dollars to prove that we have the capability to demonstrate our ability to, to build that exact engine. I've always encouraged the nation and uh, to kind of follow what we saw in Russia, that they as a country invested consistently in propulsion technology. We have kind of fallen behind in advanced technology. When we went to Russia, there were things that they were doing that we found in our textbooks said was impossible. So, you know, it just shows that you can break the bounds of technology, and we have the ability now that we know how to do it and uh, ready to do it. The people, at the United Launch Lights and industry, the work that's being done at Marshall Space Flight Center and at the Air Force Research Labs has been pushing our envelope of technology. We need to stay on that constancy of purpose. Mr. Musk, uh, one cannot help but be impressed by the numbers that you've given us in terms of the cost of your product uh, measured against ULA. We start with the premise that Senator Shelby noted. ULA has a flawless record. It's well, been able to achieve yeah. uh, <clears throat> the goals that we've set for them time and time and time again. Your suggestion is we've paid dearly for it and could pay a lot less now. I guess the question I need to ask, the premise of this, is goes back to the creation of ULA. Do you believe it is possible to maintain two companies in competition for future launches? And could your company, with uh, a record of success but more limited because of the time that you've been around, be able to compete without, for, for example, commercial business to sustain you when government budgets cannot? Um, yeah, absolutely. First, I, I, I should mention that the, the, the premise of, of perfect success is not, not quite correct for, for ULA. It is, um, they, they certainly have a very good uh, track record, but the, the first Delta IV Heavy uh, failed, and there was a partial failure of the, uh, one of the Atlas missions, uh, which resulted in a satellite having reduced life. So it's certainly a good, but, but it's not, not quite correct to say it's, it's a, it would be a flawed premise to say that it's, it's perfect. Um, what I think is a logical sort of thing going forward is that there would be two families of rockets, but not three families of rockets. So currently, ULA 
has both the atlas and the delta, but those, those are redundant. Um, you don't need both of those rocket families. Um, and I think it would make sense to, to you know, for, for the long-term security interests of the country to probably phase out the Atlas V, which depends on the Russian engine, um, and have uh, ULA operate the, the Delta family, uh, SpaceX operate the, the, the Falcon family, giving the uh, Defense Department uh, assured access to space with two completely different rocket families. I think that's, that's the logical thing to do uh, going forward. And I think it would be um, the best thing on, on, in every respect for the, for, for the country. Mr. Gass, before I uh, was chair of this subcommittee, uh, we looked closely at the ELC account, the cost plus account that basically has uh, been described in many different ways to maintain the capability infrastructure necessary. So we are dealing, when we deal with ULA, which with the actual fixed price of the product the launch that we are purchasing, and then an ELC, which has been characterized as an infrastructure investment, a subsidy, a cost-plus item. What I hear from Mr. Musk is that he doesn't need that cost-plus item. He doesn't need that subsidy in order to compete with you. So the question for the taxpayers, why should we give your company a special break when it comes to these launches if you can't meet competition head-on? Well, first, uh, again, thank you for the question, and I knew, knew it was coming. And, you know, when I was listening to Mr. Musk, uh, an ironic moment came back to me in that uh, it was probably more than a decade and a half that I was sitting in the back of a room like this when there was some generals and, and some industry leaders sitting here explaining to senators like yourself about uh, why there were some of these failures that cost billions of dollars of lost capability, and they were held accountable. And most of them, their careers ended, and... Uh, uh, and we changed the acquisition strategy. And the ELC was, a, was an outgrowth of that event. What, and I want to put you in the shoes of uh, the director of the National Reconnaissance Office and the Air Force in 2004. The two companies competed. We were on a FAR-12 fixed-price type contract, as he, Mr. Musk uh, was, was advocating. All the national security satellites that Congress funded that were being new, new, new starts was significantly behind schedules. The capabilities in orbit were significantly deteriorating. The satellites were not sure when they were going to come out of factories. They were going through final tests. They were having problems. And the nation needed the launch vehicle company to stand ready. Whenever that satellite came, the nation needed that satellite to be launched successfully whenever it was ready. In a fixed price business, we were losing money. There was no satellites to be launched. We had people standing around. We would have furloughed our workforce for a while and come back when there was enough demand when, the, when those satellites were ready, pull up the demand. So we had to create, come up with a, a solution that provided the national security capability. So the ELC is just that capability that gives the flexibility to the warfighter to make the critical decisions when they need it. It's, not a, it's categorically not a subsidy. I wish I had a contract that uh, Mr. Musk has that uh, he has from the NASA uh, commercial uh, cargo activity much better for making us competitive in, 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 uh, in the true commercial market because it doesn't come with any of the constraints and burdens of accounting that I think Ms. Chaplin articul articulates that comes with a lot of restrictions. So ELC is not a subsidy. It's about providing national security capability with the focus, laser focus on mission success. And I would also encourage the committee to think about it as a pendulum. We swung at one point in time to a very commercial model. We swung to a very uh, uh, classical DOD contract, and the pendulum is moving back to a middle. We need to find that right equilibrium that brings that balance of critical missions and it promotes cost competitiveness. Thank you. I'll have some more questions in the second round. Senator Cochran. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for convening this hearing. It's obviously very appropriate and timely. Uh, I wonder what uh, the reaction of the panel is to the Air Force's new strategy to reintroduce competition in the ELV program. Uh, at the same time, um, recognizing that we have uh, significant mission success, which has been achieved by United Launch Alliance, the sole source launch provider since 2006, 
What is your reaction to that situation? Should we continue to support this as it is, or should we make changes? I'd like to go first. Uh, which, 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 who would you like to answer this? Uh, Whoever wants okay. to answer it. Um, I think when we did our report in 2011, the idea of having competition in this program arose. Um, and over time, um, DOD did recognize that this was a way to lower costs. The costs were a real issue um, back in 2011. Just to quote um, Frank Kendall, who is the acquisition leader at DOD, with no threat of competition, DOD, the ELV, and the prime contractor are in a poor negotiating position and pay the price demanded. So competition is one avenue to put pressure to lower prices. It's not the only avenue. The other avenue is to gain insight into cost and pricing and to take actions to gain more efficiencies within the program you have. The Air Force is doing both. Um, they've also, you know, the NASA side uses competition to do its launches. It works pretty effectively, and I, ULA and SpaceX are both used to working under those arrangements. It's worked well for another government agency. Mr. Gass, do you have an impression to Absolutely. share with us? Absolutely. The measures of success should not be how widely competition is employed, but how wisely competition is employed. And uh, when we started this program, we had a, uh, two competing companies, the Lockheed Martin Corporation and the Boeing Company, and it wasn't working. So can we formulate competition that could work that's actually going to save the taxpayer to money? And when you deal with the limited uh, demand of the nation and some of the unique requirements that the nation is, how are we going to have that competition to be on a fair and level playing field? Some of the most unique missions clearly don't need multiple capabilities in this country. And if we talk about fair and level competition, is, is it two companies? Is it three companies? Is it four companies? When does it stop? And how do you uh, limit other companies from wanting to participate and taking a niche of the, of the product? I shared the story of when I was here uh, in, uh, about a decade and a half ago, I was running a program called the Atlas II. It was supporting DOD programs on a far competitive basis. When we were launching basically the military satellite constellation, we had a block buy of Discus and UHF, which had been replaced by the WGS and uh, MUOS in today's constellation. We had a block buy, fixed price, commercial contract. With that contract, we were able to compete for NASA for uh, uh, commercial missions fairly successfully. After that, those disasters, I was promoted and I now had all of many launch capabilities. And I was cleared for some classified missions and recognized those missions can't work in a competitive commercial environment. There's, those capabilities are so unique that it just doesn't, would, would not work and would cost the government uh, excess funds to, to stand up multiple companies to have that redundant capability. I always go back when I share uh, with acquisition officers the story. Many years ago, I worked on the Tomahawk cruise missile program, and uh, the country wanted to dual source and have competition. Well, the demand uh, wasn't there. They told the companies, you're going to stay in business, and it quickly became a competition to win the losing share. There was no incentive to win the majority share, because if you don't have a winner-take-all, survival of the fittest kind of competition, and you, you know that you're going to be kept around, it, doesn't, it also doesn't work. Ms. Chaplin talks about the lessons learned in the balance. I'm all for that pendulum moving to, to, to the right spot for our nation and delivers taxpayers uh, a better and a more efficient active. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Musk, what is your reaction to that? Well, <clears throat> I, I think as a country, we've, we've generally decided that competition in the free market is a good thing. Um, and that monopolies are, are not good. Um, and it's interesting to note that from the point at which uh, Boeing and Lockheed's launch business merged, from the point at which they stopped being competitors, the costs doubled since then. Um, and I think the, the reality is uh, when competition is introduced, uh, you will set, you'll, reliability is a key factor in competition. So that, that would be a deciding factor in who wins what launches. It, it, it doesn't become less important. It becomes more important. Um, but the cost to, to the U.S. Tax, taxpayer will drop 
substantially. I think they will drop at least to the level that uh, they were before Boeing and Lockheed became a monopoly in the launch business, and perhaps even better than that. And, and frankly, if, if power rockets are good enough for, for NASA, why are they not good enough for, for the Air Force? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Hmm. Dr. Pace? Well, I think the previous two comments have highlighted uh, the importance of looking at this as more than just DOD. That is, what actions occur in the commercial market, what actions occur with NASA, uh, all affect the same industrial base. There isn't really a DOD space launch industrial base. There's a U.S. launch industrial base. And so what actions other agencies pursue uh, has an impact here. Uh, as is mentioned, NASA has been successful uh, in using more streamlined processes for buying uh, its launches. Uh, I think it's also fair to say that NASA doesn't have the same policy uh, requirements for assured access to space that DOD does. Uh, I dealt when I was at NASA with um, a lot of the science mission community, and uh, they were plainly opportunistic. They would buy the best, most reliable vehicle they could at, uh, at least cost, uh, but they did not have the same policy imperatives for assured access to space for all their payloads uh, that DOD does. So the question is, what does the government want? How much is it willing uh, to give regulatory relief to move that pendulum back, and how much does it still want to have the kind of cost and data and pricing insights uh, that it's traditionally asked for? And whatever it does, uh, it needs to be done beyond just DOD, but needs to be looking at other government purchases, you know, such as NASA practices. Um, that would be my response. Yeah, thank you. Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much for holding this hearing. I'm not a newcomer to this issue. I think it was several years ago that ULA came in and talked to me, and um, all of these companies are in California in one way or another. And so I've had a great interest in trying to follow this, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I don't believe that the promised savings of eliminating competition have materialized. Uh, the cost to the government, to the taxpayer, really has skyrocketed. Behind me is a chart from the GAO's written testimony for this morning's hearing. It depicts the cost of the EELV program since its inception. The red line shows when ULA uh, was formed. So the cost of this program before and after competition for space launch depicted by the red line, is starting, startling. Since 2006, when ULA was formed, space, la space launch costs have increased from $613 million to $1.63 billion in FY14. That's a 166% increase for the program overall. Mr. Musk mentioned, and he's correct, that in 2012, this program triggered a non McCurdy breach when average procurement unit costs grew 58.4% against both the original 2004 and 2007 modified baseline. Most startling, the most recent independent cost estimate from the cost assessment and program evaluation of DOD projects the program will cost close to $70 billion through 2030. I welcomed Secretary Kendall's acquisition decision memorandum dated November 27, 2012. And I'd like to submit this for the record, if I may, Mr. Chairman. The memo states, and let me read it, I direct the Air Force to aggressively introduce a competitive procurement environment in the EELV -E program by competing up to 14 cores with initial contract awards as early as 2015 for missions that can be flown as early as 2017. Uh, and then it gave specific directions to the Secretary of the Air Force, which I think will be interesting uh, to read. Unfortunately, it appears the Air Force is not living up to the direction provided by the Undersecretary. According to information provided to my office, it appears the Air Force is going to delay and reduce the number of cores that will be competitively procured before FY17. 
And I think that's really a shame. I have three quick questions. Mr. Musk, SpaceX has achieved, as you just pointed out, three consecutive successful launches of its Falcon 9 rocket. The major re that's the major requirement for being certified for competition for EELV contracts by the Air Force. So what challenges, if any, do you expect from the Air Force certification process? Uh, the, the Air Force certification process appears to be going quite well, um, and uh, we're, we're not aware of any issues that would prevent us from being certified uh, to fly missions uh, and completing that certification this year. Um, we, we are concerned about any delays in, in the contracting, and hopefully, the, um, hopefully those delays don't materialize. And as I mentioned in my earlier testimony, I think in, in light of, the, of recent uh, events on the international stage, it may be uh, wise to consider whether uh, procuring the, the Atlas for, as part of the 36 core block buy, um, which, which is a five-year buy, as was mentioned earlier by Mr. Gass, they only have a two-year supply of engines, and yet this contract is, this is a five-year contract for the 36 cores. So uh, if there are any sanctions or if there's any issue with supply of those engines, they will not be assured access to space for the Atlas V. Now, according to the Kendall memo that I, I just mentioned, new entrants should be able to begin competing for up to 14 EELV launches by uh, FY15. Do you expect the Air Force to live up to the requirement imposed upon it by Under Secretary Kendall? Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that the, the Air Force will uh, adhere to, to that uh, requirement. So you believe that you will be able to compete for 14 EELV launches by FY15? I'm highly confident that we will be able to do so, yes. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Senator Shelby? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Musk, you recognize, <clears throat> excuse me, in your statement for the record that the Air Force, Air Force's acquisition approach requiring detailed cost data, accounting, auditing, and other mission assurance requirements adds, these are your words, adds substantial overhead costs to the taxpayer for oversight of a, of a largely mature booster core. Yet when you compare SpaceX and the ULA launch prices, do you ignore the fact that the ULA currently complies with the mandates uh, that you acknowledge adds substantial overhead costs. It seems like your price estimates compare apples and oranges. And why should, Mr. Musk, why should SpaceX be exempt from the same auditing, oversight, and accounting rules that DOD requires of the United Launch? If SpaceX is required to comply with those specific requirements, how will that impact the cost of your launch vehicle? Is that you understand? Sure. Certainly. Um, so we provide uh, <clears throat> full and detailed insight into all of our costs. <clears throat> uh, we've uh, been doing so for a long time to NASA, uh, and we're also providing that to the Air Force. So the, the government has complete insight into our cost structure. There is additional cost for U.S. government missions uh, due to the mission assurance process because the U.S. government does not buy uh, launch insurance. So in order to improve the probability of success, there is... Um, quite a, uh, a substantial mission assurance uh, overhead that's applied, uh, which is why the, our, our launch costs are estimated to be 50% uh, higher for Air Force flights than for commercial flights. So instead of $60 million for a commercial mission, it's $90 million. But that compares to more like $380 million for United Launch Alliance. Uh, so even when you add the Air Force overhead, there is still a huge difference. In fact, all of the numbers I was referring to are including the Air Force overhead. Should you have the same rules to apply to your company that the United Launch has applied to them, I guess is the question. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Uh, Ms. Chaplin, i got to direct this to you and GAO. You've explained to the committee that a fixed-price commercial contract in accordance with FAR Part 12 limits the DOD's insight into contractor costs, which has caused problems in the past. Could you describe for the committee the problems that have occurred in the past and your view of the utility in ensuring that DOD continues to acquire detailed cost data going forward? 
whoever's doing it. Okay. Um, I would like to say when there was commercial contracts used at the beginning of the EELV program, the suppliers did not have to follow those requirements. When the EELV program transferred into using a cost type arrangement for one of its contracts, then they were required to have those systems. And the reason those systems are there is when you have a cost type contract, the government needs to validate those costs. They're not just paying some price. They just, they are paying the costs incurred. So you need standard certified systems to ensure those costs incurred are valid. They include things, overhead, pensions, everything that's allowable that the company incurs while it's making that product or producing that service. If going into this competition, DOD chooses the commercial approach, those requirements will not be required of either party. If they choose the approach that they're using now, the requirements will be imposed on both parties. The systems do provide good data. They give you insight into costs. They give a uniform way of measuring. They help impose discipline on a program. There's a lot of value, and it was a long, hard fight to get those in the current program. It was not easy. It's not an easy accomplishment to do. After a time period where you weren't required to do that, that was also tied to these lot buys early on in the program. So it's reasonable why they wasn't required in the very beginning. Um, so there's value to these requirements, but under a commercial approach, the bottom line is price, and those requirements wouldn't be required of either party. Mr. Musk, would, would you uh, concede that 68 consecutive launches is a great record? Um, I, I, I would, although I'd like to point out that there were two uh, highly publicized uh, failure investigations, one for Delta IV Heavy, one for Atlas. Uh, then the Air Force conducted failure investigations. They're, they're, it, they have a, ULA has a very good track record. It is just not quite as perfect as 68 perfect launches. Mr. Yeah. Gash, you have any response? We measure the mission success by, by our customers' declaration. And so if they declare that the satellite and the mission is, is success, we use the same record. The, uh, and why it's that important, because our profit is tied to a mission success. If we don't deliver it, it's not only we lose, forfeit our profit, but potentially get a penalty. So the declaration is about the on-orbit capability, and uh, that's how we measure success. Uh, Mr. Musk, in October 2012, I believe this is right, a secondary payload aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket was sent into the wrong orbit because one of the nine Merlin engines powering the rocket failed. What recourse did the owner of the secondary payload have in that situation to recover damages? In other words, what... What's, what's next? What was next? Um, right. Well, um, by ULA's definition of success, that, that mission was perfect. No, that was perfect, although you went into the uh, wrong orbit and so forth. You're right. That's perfect. So, so the, the primary mission, which, which, which uh, was to deliver the Cassiope satellite, was 100% successful. Uh, there was a secondary satellite that was an optional objective that, that uh, uh, was, was not part of the primary mission. Um, but uh, as I said, if, if, if you accept uh, ULA's definition of perfect success, then that mission was perfectly successful. Mr. Gass? It, it would not be uh, declared successful. If that was a contracted requirement, we would... We would he would say it was successful we by would, his criteria, but you'd say it was not successful right. you, if, by if, yours. You know, we could have a debate about uh, success, success, but if... If it's considered an experiment and the rocket was supposed to perform okay. all the capabilities and it didn't, it, that's, uh, you know, that's a different kind of business arrangement. But in our measure of success, we put margins in. The anomalies that Mr. Musk referred to that we had on United Launch Lines was design margins. The margins came into play, and we were able to successfully deliver the, the satellite. Okay. It, it is an uh, incredibly risky business, and everything needs to work perfectly. Dr. Pace, you have any comment on that? Uh, I would add um, more from as a as a former uh, analyst, uh, you know, with with NASA, um, that getting detailed understanding of the prices and costs. Prices we understood, I think, with SpaceX. Understanding all the costs, I think, was somewhat more difficult. Uh, SpaceX did not have when I was at NASA uh, the detailed level of business accounting systems. 
uh, that we were used to on, on other projects. So we had a very robust uh, dialogue with uh, SpaceX people, and we ha got a lot of information. There's a lot of cooperation. But I would have to say that uh, really understanding all those costs to the same level of detail was, was hard to come by. Um, and so eventually in some areas we said, you know, there's some, there's some magic going on on SpaceX. Uh, we don't fully understand, uh, but we appreciate the results. Again, how much is the government willing to pay and impose uh, on uh, SpaceX on these contracts? If it's not willing to impose those kind of detailed reporting requirements, are they willing to relax them, you know, on other players? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Shelby. Um, in this round, I'm going to take what I consider, after listening to the testimony and reading the background here, the best arguments on both sides and ask you each to address them. I'll preface my question to Mr. Musk as follows. In this new job, I'm traveling around the United States seeing some amazing capacity that we have developed. Newport News, the very best when it comes to building submarines, aircraft carriers, head up to Connecticut, helicopters, wherever you go in this country, California as well, Boeing in the Midwest, you see some exceptional uh, companies doing exceptional work keeping us as safe as possible. And they all say to me, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, if you keep cutting these budgets, we're going to be laying off the best workers in the world. And when you need us, if you ever need us, we won't be there. So you've got to find a way to maintain our capacity to build, even if we're not at war, even if our budgets are going down. When I heard Mr. Gass explain the ELC, I think that's what I heard. He suggested there was a time when the workers were idle. Uh, they weren't being called to have as many launches as they were in the past. And so the ELC, some call it subsidy, some call it something else, is basically there to maintain capacity, even if the demand is not there. So let me ask you this. What kind of risk do we run as a country to jeopardize the capacity of ULA by eliminating the subsidy or not factoring it into the bid so that ultimately war, no war, good budget, bad budget, when we need them, they'll be there. Sure. Well, the reality is that today there's a steady cadence of Air Force and NRO missions every year. So you don't really have the, the, the wide difference that from one year to the next that you had in the past. So I think the just the prior justification of needing that for stability is no, no longer there because there is a stable launch demand from from the uh, yeah, the Air Force and the intelligence community. Um, secondly, I, I go back to the point that there's really not a need for ULA to maintain two families of rockets, uh, both the Delta and the Atlas. Uh, and given that the Atlas is dependent up, upon a Russian main engine, which can be cut off at any time, uh, the logical thing to do is to eliminate the, the Atlas family have the Delta and Falcon family, and that will provide the greatest amount of, of assured access uh, and the greatest reliability and the cost savings uh, that the government is, is looking for. Mr. Gass, you saw the chart that Senator Feinstein produced. When it comes to competition, it usually means lower cost. When there's no competition, a monopoly situation or anything close to it, uh, buyer beware. Consumer, uh, consider the possibilities here that your costs are going to go up unbridled. So what we hear from uh, Mr. Musk is that if we went into price competition, we could save a lot of money in a hurry. That, in fact, ULA, based on his estimates, is overcharging the taxpayers. Now, here we're facing a budget situation, which is awful. We are seeing uh, limited increases in defense spending and, slightly over the horizon, another sequestration coming our way. So why shouldn't we, as good stewards of taxpayers' dollars, say, well, let's put some competition in it. That's uh, the American way. That's the free market. Let's make sure that ULA is not overcharging us. When we look at the mountains on Senator Feinstein's chart, it suggests that without competition, your costs have gone up dramatically. So why wouldn't the taxpayer be better served with competition? Thank you for that question. It's important. And may I ask you to put the chart back up? First, for the record, I heard Mr. Musk use all kinds of numbers that were categorically wrong, and, and uh, I'll be glad to share with the committee the, the right calculation. G I saw this chart last night in the GAO report when it was released, and I, I, I noted it as, as well, and, and uh, that's an accurate representation of appropriation. It's not an accurate representation of cost or cost performance. Let me just point your attention to the red line. In a period of time, we were launching one or two a year. Satellites were late, and as you described, we were being paid for 
a capability to stand ready. As we go out to the outer years, we're now buying rockets and launching in about a 10 or 11 year. So if you just do division, all of a sudden it'll be different. The other thing that's interesting to note, that when we converted the contract in 2006, the stewards of, for this country, the acquisition professionals, required Lockheed and Boeing and then into ULA that when we signed up the contracts prior to that red line, there was losses. We actually had to give credits at about over a billion, almost a billion dollars that we took off the contract price so you didn't have to appropriate during that time, and the company took those losses because they were overly aggressive in the pre-red line uh, activities with that expectation of commercial. So you talk about the good stewards of taxpayers, and I want to you know, give a, a compliment to the incredibly hardworking acquisition professionals that go through the data and provide and make sure that the, the nation is getting a good value. But take, take me down to the basic question here. Price competition is going to give the taxpayers a lower cost, is it not? It can, if it's, if it's on a fair and open playing field and everybody has to have the same requirements. The problem with that statement is, if everybody has to have the same requirements and the certain requirements that are only, you don't need, there'll be excess capacity because there's just not enough work for two, and if everybody has to have it, it could create excess cost. The other example that I gave before when they talked about the Tomahawk cruise missile, if you know you're not going to lose, that's not a winner take all, you may not have the right kind of incentives. At the same time that Ms. Feinstein shows the ex increase in the appropriation, there was a period of time where we had a contract that was not incentivizing cost performance. We had what we call an award fee contract where requirements could creep up. And for, as a company, when an award fee, if we said no and pushed back in the requirements, you get negatively rewarded on, on, your, on your profit rate. Today, the Air Force fixed that. We have a very clear contract that's aligned on, on the priorities. That's one, mission success is a major portion of our profit, and we have a cost incentive contract on EL ELC. We have to year over year improve. We signed up to a greater than a 5% year over year improvement. It's already in the contract, and we're incentivized to improve upon that. And uh, so it's the right kind of contract for the time frame. The period of time where the satellites were not coming on a regular basis as a different time frame than where we are today. I came into this into the building and talked to the DOD officials as early as 2008, seeing that things were going to get more stable, that we needed to change the acquisition strategy. And it took us to 2012 for us to do that, but it's on the right path. Senator Cochran. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for convening this hearing. I think it's been a very helpful exercise. I have no further questions, but I will want to compliment the um, efforts that uh, the contractors are making to produce products which protect the security interests of our country at a reasonable price. To Mr. Gass, I'm trying to remember how many years ago we met, but it was quite a few. And when we met, you know, I was surprised that this was essentially a monopoly. And I think we talked about it. And you assured me that these costs would go down. Now, if I understand you correctly today, what you're saying is, well, there are, uh, we have to follow one set of restrictions and they follow another set of restrictions. A and I don't quite understand this. Would you oppose an open competition if all the rules across the board were the same? Would ULA actually say, we don't want to compete with SpaceX? Absolutely not. Thank you. Absolutely not. Uh, ULA is ready and willing and able to compete on any field. Full See, of I, I would think that would be your answer. And I think, would think that that would be satisfactory because, after all, competition is the American basic demand uh, for the accordance of a contract. So what keeps us from doing this? Uh, basically, uh, SpaceX doesn't have all the capabilities nor the requirements. So if, if, if you think about it, if SpaceX's requirements have to come down and some of our requirements have to have to be eliminated till we get that level playing field. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Musk, respond to that. If this is the heart of the matter, respond to it. Yeah, I, I believe SpaceX has, can, can manage all of the Air Force requirements. 
Um, yeah, we, we might argue that maybe some of those requirements um, shouldn't be there, but we, we will meet whatever requirements the Air Force uh, asks of us, um, and uh, we believe we can, we can uh, manage all of the Air Force's uh, satellites and, and then some. How much of this is in the fixed price competition versus cost plus? Uh, well, I, I think I think fixed price competition is is the the better way to go. When when there is competition, the, the the logical thing to do is to go for a fixed price because otherwise, if you compete it and it's cost plus, then it gives the uh, companies the opportunity to raise their, their their prices effectively as their costs grow subsequent to the competition. Do you have a qu problem with that, Mr. Gass? Uh, I think it's important that the government understands what it's buying. I shared the story about the times when we had failures and I was working on a, a fully fixed price contract. And then when I was cleared for some missions that uh, I know that you're well aware of, those kinds of missions is very difficult to support on a, on a fixed price basis. The operational needs, the changes in schedules, the, the care and feeding that some of the satellites need unique facilities. We talk about the rockets, but uh, we're required to have special handling equipment, uh, nitrogen purges for some of the, uh, uh, to protect some of the most sensitive sensors that are on some of these satellites. Very unique capabilities that only the national security needs. They're not commercial commodities. And right now, the way we're doing the contracting today, in, when we use the term ELC, we're applying those costs to all missions. And it goes back to the roots of what, how the EELV program was established. And it was come from a Mormon, what General Mormon report in the 1990s. And the goal was to lower costs for the nation across all of our national launch, security, national launch security needs, not one mission area or not. So on average, our costs have come down. The program is greatly successful, and we're continuing to drive the cost down, and the productivity is, is, is improving. But the key about, if you, your question was about fixed price is can you really apply it to everything? And it's about choices the nation needs to make. We can use it. I talked about the pendulum swinging. We can go back to that way, and we'll see some of the errors. Ms. Chaplin's team has done a great job on the report of laying out the balances, the trades that the nation has to make. It's not about what companies want. It's about what the country needs and how the, how the government and leaders make choices of how to deliver that. So I'm trying to understand what you're saying. What you're saying is, if the requirements for a bid were all the same across the board, we would have no problem. Is that correct or not? It would be fine for the competition, but just yesterday, uh, in the 14th Air Force out in California, had to make some mission switches between NASA and the Air Force. They just gave direction. A NASA mission was late. An Air Force mission moved in. Another NASA. NASA Air Force mission took priority, another NASA mission was moved out. If we were on a fixed price world, that would be a series of contractual actions, potentially not having the capability to accommodate that because it took some money to create that flexibility. In a fixed price world, that operational flexibility is not there for the warfighter, but it works for competition. May Mr. Musk respond to that? Would you respond to that? Certainly. So I, th I think. Um, the, the logical thing to do is to do a, a fixed price competition for the basic vehicle, and then to the degree that there are mission unique requirements, um, that, that there's a, there's a that, which is a fairly small part of the, the mission, uh, that that would be cost plus. So, so if if, if um, you know if the, if the Air Force says, well, there's a, a unique national security satellite, it's going to require these additional changes to the rocket or to the mission. Um, or it's going to require priority, then, then that, just that incremental piece, would, would be, it would be logical to make that cost plus. But the vast majority of the contract would be fixed price. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> We're talking about competition, real competition. And if you can get it, it's the best thing in the market. We all know that. Dr. Pace, in a classic market of multiple buyers and sellers, competition generally produces quality products and lower prices. The launch market is characterized by limited demand, few suppliers, and multiple government industrial policies. Therefore, lowering the cost of access to space while retaining performance and reliability may not result in price decrease for buyers. We don't know. If DOD has to pay, for example, new entrants for the infrastructure and labor costs now included in the EELV launch capability contract, 
How would duplication of existing infrastructure result in lower launch costs for DOD? Uh, a lot of us are concerned that recreating the wheel could actually increase overall costs compared to what DOD is currently paying. Would you have a comment on that? That's certainly, that's certainly possible. I think what we could see happening is that the introduction of competition could lower uh, the cost by, as a virtue of lower prices for a wide category of services. There's a number of missions that I think SpaceX, for example, could certainly compete for. There are a number of missions that it may take a while before SpaceX can, can compete, uh, as mentioned, the Delta, Delta IV class systems, although eventually it may compete for those as well. So the question is, what do you want the industrial base to actually look like? If you break these costs out, if you charge extra for non-commercial processes, is the government willing to pay for that, or do they prefer the convenience of bundling all that up? Mm -hmm. I could imagine a situation where Atlas exits the market, as described, uh, where Falcon takes over uh, for most of that. We're still retaining the Delta IVs, and that is a much more uh, segmented market. But as a result of that segmentation, you'll simply have a new set of monopolies. You'll have areas where only the Delta is going to be meeting that uh, until SpaceX develops new products. You may have situations where only the Falcon is meeting other needs. So you'll be swapping the number of players around. You'll be breaking costs out in a more clean way. But whether total costs go down for the government, I think, is still something that remains remain to be seen. How important is quality? In other words, the 68 straight launches, successful launches, important to DOD, for example? And well, I think it's, it's absolutely, absolutely crucial because what's happened so far is that uh, we've paid, the, we as a government have paid for reliability and readiness. Mm -hmm. I would also say that SpaceX is accumulating launch experience at a very, very rapid rate. Every one of those uh, Falcons that goes off, that's, that's 10 engines, as I understand, that are, that are being qualified. So their rate of experience is building up quickly, but ULA has a longer range of experience with a wider range of payloads. So it's really two, two things that are quite different from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I do have a number of other questions questions I'd like to submit for the record. Certainly. Both. And um, if there are no further questions in today's panel, I want to thank uh, all of you for being with us, Dr. Pace, Mr. Musk, Mr. Gass, and Ms. Chaplin. Thank you for your contribution today. There will be written questions coming your way, and we hope that you'll respond to them in a timely fashion so we can make this report available to the public, and this meeting of the subcommittee will stand adjourned. Very interesting. <clears throat>